Hello and welcome back. I hope you had some time to read up on Rails. So at this point, I'm going to encourage you to start taking notes in this lecture. This lecture is very important because we'll explore the structure of a Rails application, but also just to keep track of what we're learning and to basically reference back to anything that we may need to. All right. So, so far what we've covered, you should know what is Rails already. Who is David Heinmeier Hansen? Okay, what are Ruby meetups? The components of a Rails application is something we'll cover in this video. What are gems? What is rubygems.org? And what is rubyonrails.org? So except for what are the components of a Rails application, you should be able to answer all the other questions so far. Okay, so let's move on. Okay, so we're back to our IDE. Now, Rails is, as you know, a web application framework, and frameworks have several components. I'll briefly go through it, but before that, let me start a new Rails application, all right? So we're gonna build our applications in a Rails project folder under code. So navigate to code first, so CD code. And now over here, we're going to create a directory. So mkdir rails underscore projects. Whoops, I think I misspelled it over there. So move rails projects, rails projects. All right, so if I do ls now, I should have rails projects. All right, so now I'm gonna navigate to rails projects. So cd rails projects. Okay, let me clear up the screen. So let's create our first Rails application. You create a new Rails application by typing in Rails space new and then space the name of the application. So I'm just going to call this test underscore app. Okay, so the application's being created. As you can see, it's creating all these folders and files and it's running bundle install. Now bundle install is basically bundler is a gem that goes out there to rubygems.org and then it grabs all the gems out of the box that come with a default Rails application and then it installs it in our application directory. It basically creates a sandbox and installs all the gems that we need to get a default Rails application running. Now later on you can add gems to the application or remove gems as you need, but some come out of the box with a Rails application. So once this completes, we're gonna have a fully functioning Rails application. Okay, it just completed. Now let me pull it up over here. So under code, there's my Rails projects. Here's my test app. Now if I click on it, look at all the files and folders that it created. So you have this app folder, bin, config, db, lib. If you look into any folder, look at other folders, then files, a lot of things have happened, okay? So Rails, what it does is it follows the MVC structure, okay? MVC stands for Model View Controller, okay? It's the MVC pattern of web app development. So let's take a look at a diagram for a MVC structure. Let me pull it up real quick. Okay, here we go. So when you or anyone from the browser, so you basically type in a link and hit enter, that request, that is called a HTTP GET request, okay? Now there are lots of HTTP verbs, but right now all we care about is that request. It's a HTTP GET request, that is received by the router of your Rails application. The router then directs this request to the appropriate controller based on the type of request it is. And then the controller either renders a view and redirects to an appropriate page, or the controller then reaches out, which is the persistence layer of your application, get some info or add some info and then renders a view to basically let the user know whatever their request was, a response to their request. Either it could be, okay, an update was made, or hey, you have logged in, whatever the response is supposed to be. 
Okay, so let's go through that again. User issues a request that is received by the routers in your Rails application. Then the router directs that request to an appropriate controller. Controller either renders a view or controller reaches out to the model. The model, based on the request, speaks to the database, either updates or receives information, and then sends it back to the controller. The controller then renders a view, okay? So that is how a Rails application works. So notice how you have the router, you have controller, view, model, there's the M, there's the V, there's the C, and there is a separation of these three. That is the MVC model of Rails applications. And if you look at the directory under app, you'll see controllers neatly organized in this folder. You see models neatly organized in this folder and views organized here and they're separated. Okay. So it's easy for you to work with them. And we were talking about the routes. The routes of the application are housed here. So if you, you have the app directory, you have the config directory under config directory there are the routes for your application in the routes.rb file okay there are currently no routes for this application so everything is commented out but this is where all the routes are housed all right so let's look at some of the other directories that got created so first you have your app app has assets all right so these are your static assets if you have any images in your application, they're housed here. JavaScripts used in your application, any JS files over here. Style sheets used in your application, all housed here. Then you have your controllers. It comes with an application controller, but any other controller you will add to your application will be housed here. Helpers. Helpers are where we extract out common logic that we use in our views, okay? Only for views. Mailers, this is for mailing options. Models, this is where you're going to store all your model files. Views, so all the pages that will be rendered to user. And under views, if you look at layouts, it already comes with a application HTML ERB file, okay? This is the default layout file that comes with your Rails application already. All right. Then you have bin, you have executables here. We don't really care about that. We don't do anything to bin. Then you have config, all right? Config, there are a couple of important ones here. Database YAML, all right? It tells you about how your application is communicating with database. So over here, you see that by default, it's a SQLite 3 database. Now, you could have issued a command not to use SQLite, or use MySQL or PostgreSQL, but we went with the default, which is good enough for development, which is SQLite 3. Then if you look at routes.rb file, this is where our routes are going to be. And then if you look at environments over here, you have development, the settings for your development environment, production, settings for your production environment, and test, settings for your test environment. Okay, and then below you have the DB folder. So far, there's nothing here, but this is where all your migrations are going to be stored. Your migration files, which are basically the files that your application uses to create tables in your database. Now, when you think of tables, you can think of Excel spreadsheets, and that'll make thinking about it easier. Right now, we don't have to worry too much about it. When we start working with databases, we'll think about those. Then lib, over here you have your assets. We're not going to use this much here because we're going to house our assets in the app assets directory, which is on top. All right, next we have logs. For when we're building the application, all the logs from our server output will be stored here. Public, this has these pages that are available directly from the application, okay? If you go to that link from the application, you will be served these pages. So if you click on it, there are the different pages that Rails comes with. Then test, 
This is what your test directory. If you create automated tests, they will be housed here. Temp, we don't have to worry about. Vendor, we don't have to worry about. And this one, very important, this is your gem file. Okay, remember we talked about rubygems.org where all the gems for your application are picked up from? So here are the gems that your application comes default with. See that it's Rails 4.2.3. This version could be different for you depending on when you are viewing this video. Then you have the SQLite gem, which is for database. You have SAS Rails, Uglyfire, Coffee Rails, jQuery Rails, Turbo Links, JBuilder. And specific to your development and testing environment, you have Bybug, Web Console, Spring. Now these all came default out of the box with your application. Gemfile.lock. This is where all the dependencies and versions are stored. Now we're not going to make any updates to this file directly, but Heroku uses this file. So we're gonna make sure we commit any changes in our gem file that update this lock file before we push this to production, okay? But again, we're not gonna make any updates to that file directly. There's the rake file, which we don't really have to worry about right now. Then you have the readme.rdoc file. Now this is important. Remember we went to the device GitHub repository and there were instructions at the bottom. So that is the readme of that code repository. So whatever you put here will be displayed in your code repository when someone visits your code repo. So it's very important to have like some relevant information about your application or anything you want to expose about your application over here. So as you know, Rails is a full stack solution, okay? What does that mean? It means it's an all-encompassing solution. It has the front end, it has the back end with the database, and everything is housed here, right? So for that to work, you need several components. You have your front end, you have the database, you also have things like the server, the web server. Now, what am I talking about? Right now, I have this application, right? And if I pull up, let's say, a preview of this application, let me click on this. If I click on preview and then port, see nothing's happening. It's saying that we could not connect to a server running on this port. What does that mean? That means that the server isn't running, right? You have a server. Now, what is a server? Now, I'm going to pull up a diagram to make thinking of the components of this web application a little easier, hopefully. Okay, so let me do that real quick. Now, here it is. Think of your whole web application ecosystem as a restaurant. All right? You have the customer for the restaurant who happens to be a user for your application. Now, this person is going to go click around on the URL or on the browser or any links in your application. Then you have the kitchen of the restaurant. Now this is your Rails application. By default, the customer has no link or no access to the Rails application or to the kitchen. Like, if you think about it, you walk into a restaurant, you don't directly go back to the kitchen and say, hey, I want this dish, right? There's no link. You need a server, a waiter, who basically gets the request from you, communicates it to the kitchen, brings the food back, and then gives it to you at your table, okay? So that's the server, and quite literally, for web applications, this guy is the web server. Now the menu, which I don't have an image of here, is what your Rails application makes. Facebook, for example, provide social networking. So the menu would have friends, messages, like, dislike, sharing photos, homepage, feed, and a ton of other things. LinkedIn is a networking site from a career perspective. So the menu has connecting to peers, posting and sharing, or submitting resumes, contacts, publications, etc. So let's assume our app has a menu already. For that menu to work, or for you to be able to use that menu, which is use the features of the web application and do something with it. You need the server and of course you need the kitchen or the application, all right? So let's go to our application and start the server and see if we can change that preview page which we weren't able to pull up before, all right? Okay, so back to our application. To run the server, first you need to navigate to your application and I'd call it test app if I do ls over here. Notice how I have test app. So I'm gonna to navigate to my application, cd, test app. To run the server, 
I issue this command rails s dash b or I can just say rails server if you're working locally you can simply say rails server and this will work but since we're using the nitrous IDE we need to say rails space server space dash b and then 0, .0, .0, .0. hit enter now if you click on preview for 3000 there it is your application notice that what's happening here this is your server that's running so this is your communication between yourself the user and the kitchen which is the rails app so if i go here click about your applications environment that's your menu and you have clicked on something and it's communicated with your rails application to render this view to you now there's a second component to this and i want you to think about this for a second our server right and let me pull up the image our server over here they work in shifts okay because we're in development they work in shifts and then the restaurant closes and opens at different times basically whenever we have the server running our restaurant is open for business but in the web the web is 24 7 so you need to have the server and your application present 24 hours a day right so in the web world you deal with this second aspect of this which is called production so what we've discussed so far is development but this also applies to production but production is a separate instance altogether it is not tied to your development okay because your restaurant in production is open 24 hours the servers work all day and night there's no break there's no shifts they're always ready for customers to come to the restaurant and you know basically order so basically users clicking on url so you cannot have your local development server running since it's tied to our local machine. So you need a production hosted version of your application. All right. And for Rails, as with everything, getting started with production is very easy and free. What we're going to use in this course is Heroku, which specializes in production environments, is free for starting out, and houses our application or any applications we'll build. So it'll be our restaurant 24 seven, making our application available to the world. Now it's very important to differentiate development and production. Okay. Development is this right here. Okay. This is what you and your code developers work on. Think of this as a training camp for your servers, the kitchen, the users, and the users are all fake. Production, on the other hand, everything is real. You only deploy to production once your portions over here are working in your fake training environment, which is development, and are ready for live use, no longer fake. Things like your database in productions, users using that application, that's all real information, and consequences with dealing with that info is real. So you have to be careful with production, but not necessarily with development, where you can try things. We'll talk about things like Heroku and production later on. So the server, this server that's running, that comes default with your web application, it's called Webrick, and it's adequate for learning Rails and smaller apps to start. Now, in your development environment, you need to shut down your server. So to shut down your server, all you do is hit Control C, and that shuts down your server. Okay? So hope all of that makes sense. I'm going to do a quick review right now. Let me pull up another diagram. Now, here it is. You have your iPad or iPhone or your web page, which is used to, which is used by users to interact with your application. You have your local development ID, which has your Rails application. Whenever you need this communication line to be open, you start the web server. But once you have deployed your application to production, you have a production instance of your application. The server is always running, and they can directly communicate with your users. And this is available for users to go via a link at all times. You don't need to shut down the server here or start the server or anything like that. All right, so I hope all of that made sense. And I know it's a good amount to absorb, so I would recommend reviewing this video if you need. And make sure you take notes. And I'll see you in the next video.